We'll turn to James, James chapter 5. We're going to talk about patience today. Now, I know I'm probably the only one here that needs patience, right? I need patience and I need it right now. It's going to require a lot of patience for all of us here um, the next couple of weeks. You know, next Sunday, we'll be meeting across the road. They're going to be doing some, uh, they're going to repaint the, the sanctuary in here and out in the foyer, and there's going to be work going on everywhere. And so I'm sorry if you're inconvenienced, but <laughs> plan to meet across the road next week. And all will be well. Amen? Amen. And uh, we'll come back and we'll have a fresh painted uh, sanctuary to, to worship in. It's going to require a lot of patience. That, that's always difficult. We have, a lot of equipment has to move over and then a lot of things have to change over there. And it's a lot of work and so it's going to require a lot of patience. And patience these days is a rare commodity in our technological world that we live in. Amen? In our Western world, we are increasingly accustomed to responses, uh, immediate response in almost every situation. We think somehow or another, for some reason or other, that quick is better. Now, Brother Ken, he's, you slowed down, hadn't you, Brother? Quick is not always best, right? But do you have patience? Never mind, don't answer that. <laughs> if any of you have been to the doctor lately? <clears throat> you know, the doctor's office is one of our stress factors. I don't know why we're all surprised by, by waiting. I mean, they labeled it the waiting room, okay? That's what we do is we wait. You also wait in a lot in restaurants. Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> restaurants are famous for waiting. You wait to get a seat, right? And then you wait to get the menu. And then you wait to order, right? And then you have to wait to get the food. And then you have to wait to get the bill. And in some restaurants... You, uh, you, you have to wait for the bill to be picked up and then to, to stand in line to pay for it. So I, we, we all seem to be fairly patient when it comes to all of that, right? <laughs> most of us can remember day. Well, maybe not, maybe not most of us. Some of us can remember a day when, when there was no automatic washing machine or dryers or, you know, I, I, when I was growing up in northwestern Oklahoma, we, we, had, a, we had an old wash tub and had a crank uh, ringer on it. And so, everyone, and, you know, and I was, it, didn't, I, it didn't take but one time when I was a kid, I wanted to see how tight that thing would squeeze. And so I, I put my finger in that thing and I cranked on it and I run it up to about that second knuckle and then I panicked and I didn't know which way to turn it to get it out. So I cranked it and get run it on up into that other knuckle and by now I'm screaming and hollering. And of course, I, I, probably not many of you remember those days. We live in a day now where we, we've got to stay busy while the washing machine's doing its thing, you know, and the dryer's doing its thing, and we've got to find other things to do because we've, we've got to work, 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 because in today's world, a person's value is determined by how productive he is, right? And so, so now we buy all this fancy technology and these washing machines, and we don't even have to go and... And, 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 and check on them. We can be busy doing other productive things and we just wait until we hear the washing machine tell us that it's over. <laughs> I 
wash machines through. <laughs> we pull up to a traffic light and 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 it, it it's red. And we sit there and we wait and we wait and wait. It seems like it's 10 minutes when it's only been one. But our, our blood pressure's going up and our ulcer's beginning to flare up. And now we're thinking, boy, if I just had a computer or laptop on, that would pop out of my steering wheel I could, and, a, and, a, and a screen that I could flip up on the dash, I could sit here during this long traffic light and I could do my work. The only problem with that is, is you'd be trying to do it while you're driving down the road. Right? Because we've got to be productive. We, we've, got to, we've got places to go, people to see, things to do. And you get behind somebody on the road that they ain't got no place to go, ain't got nobody to see, ain't got nothing to do, and they got all day to get there. <laughs> it drives me nuts for those people to get over in the left lane in a four-lane highway, to get in that left lane and just poke along. You pull up to a light and light turns green and you wait, you wait, you wait and it seems like you've waited about a minute and, and the people in the car in front of you is playing on their cell phone and I'm the world's worst. Let's go. You ain't going to get an invitation. It ain't going to turn green or get off your cell phone. Let's go. <laughs> so this message about patience is really for me. I'm sorry that you have to sit through it. I, we, we all need patience, right? And I hope you can be patient enough to sit through this. Patience is what James addresses in our passage today, and we don't really like talking about patience, do we? Because very few of us have a great deal of patience. Perhaps, just perhaps, Maybe the Lord will speak to us if we'll have patience enough to sit here and listen. So don't, don't shout me down just yet. Just as, just as grapes are the fruit of the vine, did you know that patience is the fruit of Holy Spirit working in the life of a believer? It, it, ought, to be, it, it ought to be just natural for us as born-again believers and dwelt by Holy Spirit to be a patient people, but it seems pretty obvious to me that James is writing to Christians in verse 7. Notice what he says. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. We as believers are encouraged to cultivate patience for how long? Until the Lord comes. Well, you say that might not be for another year, two years, ten years, hundred years, then let's be Patient until he does come. Amen? James gives us some examples here in our text today. We're going to look at those examples. He talks about the farmer. He talks about the prophets. He talks about Job and how much patience each of these. And, and if we look at them, they provide insight to uh, the difficulties that I believe that we all face and, and, and uh, the patience that we need to handle our situations even this very day. James says there's several situations we need patience. One is when we wait. Look, look again at, at the last part of verse 7. He says, therefore, or verse 7, therefore, brothers, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. Now, the early rains usually came in October and November, and the, the early rains were needed for the seed to sprout. And then you had a bit of a dry spell, and then the late rains came in, in now this is in Israel, came in usually in April and May, which helped mature the crop. But until those rains happened, the farmer just had to be patient. He would plow the ground, put the seed in the ground, and then it was just a waiting game. He had no control over the weather, no control over the elements of the climate at all. All he had to do, all he could do, was to wait patiently. Trust the Lord and wait patiently for the crop to begin to bear fruit. So we, we need patience when we have to wait. 
I love this illustration that James uses. He's talking about the, the farmer here and how they had to have patience. Now, I, I, I grew up in Oklahoma, and there's a, there's a lot of wheat country, uh, some barley, but mostly wheat, um, the, mostly soybeans and cotton here, right? I, I, I never really was around here much when the farming was going on, but all of us are familiar with farming, right? We pretty much understand that there's really not a whole lot you can do once you plant the seed. It, it, when you plant it, it'd be nice if when you planted it, you could sit there and watch it and it just goes, whoop, there it is. <laughs> I need some tomatoes. Plant the seed. Whoop, ah, there we go. Fresh tomato from a bologna sandwich. It'd be great if that's the way it would, but it's just not reality. And so we have to have patience. Um, the farmer... The, the, at least the ones that I, I knew that I grew up with were for the most part pretty patient people. I think farming taught them patience. They were, most of them were godly people. They were, uh, many of them went to the same church that I went to, same church that my wife was uh, saved at and, and baptized. And so th these people were godly people and they, they knew the only thing they could do would be to plant their crops and pray and trust the Lord and just be patient. So James says, look at the farmer. He, he can be patient, can't you? He's learned how to be patient. Why don't you? Obviously, it was a problem when you look at this imperative language that, he's, that he speaks us in, this was something that was going on already. In other words, in other words, he could say, stop being anxious and, and be patient. So there must have been, and I understand that, there was a lot of anxiety in that day. There was persecution. These people were being shoved around and pushed around and cheated and swindled. And I can understand why there must have been some impatience on their part. I, I I read this and I think about what am I most impatient about? Well, here lately, I'm most impatient about my lack of spirituality. I, I still get upset sometimes, do you? I, I still get upset sometimes. Sometimes I'm frustrated with me because I don't know more. Sometimes I'm frustrated with me because I read the scriptures and I don't know what it's saying. W wouldn't it be nice if the day that we got saved, we would automatically know the Bible from cover to cover? Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice if we were spiritually mature the day we got born again? It's just not real. So what happens? God has to plow up the fallow of our heart and he has to plow it and work that ground, and that's not fun. I bet you if the ground could speak, when a farmer put his plow into it, the ground would cry out, oh, don't do that. You see, sometimes when God's trying to grow us and plant seeds in us and get us to grow and to be fruitful, plowing this old fallow heart sometimes is difficult. We don't like it. Sometimes we even rebel against it. Wouldn't it be nice if we could be just spiritual giants the day we were born again? Just doesn't happen that way. The key, I think, is understanding that God's timing is perfect timing. Amen? We, we want to hurry up. We want to grow. We want to reach a certain level or we want to accomplish something. And, and sometimes it's just not God's timing. We need to understand that the key to all that's going on in our life, if God is sovereign, and he is, he's in control, then we need to understand that his timing is always perfect. He never misses. If we just wait and trust him, we'll find the waiting, I believe, a whole lot easier. I like what the prophet Michael said in chapter 7, verse 7. He says, but as for me... I will watch expectantly for the Lord. 
I will wait for God, for the God of my salvation. Have you ever had a big decision to make and, and you were resolved that God is in control, that God calls all the shots, that I'm in his hands, he is sovereign, and so I'm going to wait on him. I don't care what happens from this point until the next point. I, I'm trusting him. It doesn't matter what happens. I'm in his hands. Have you ever had a big decision to make and you just wanted to hurry up and get it done and move past it and move to the next one? I promise you, when you get over this hurdle, there's another one. Amen? And when you get over that one, there'll be another one. God didn't plant us in a rose garden, say, just enjoy the view. He put us in a garden that had to be tilled and had to be worked and planted and worked. And that's what life looks like. Life is a lot of work. Farmers, they didn't have much time for all the peripheral issues that we get involved in. They're diligent people. I don't guess I've ever known a lazy farmer. Have you? <laughs> I've, never, I've never really known a lazy farmer. He's working, always working, but he's trusting the Lord. Second thing he says here in verse 8, he says, you must be patient, strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. So while we're waiting on the Lord's coming, we are not, we're not told, go put on your white robes and sit up on top of the church building, fold our arms and just wait for the Lord. We're to be busy, amen? We're to be busy working in the kingdom. So what are you doing? Are you busy? Are you one of those that's just kind of taking your comfort in a pew and waiting on the Lord, just patiently waiting on him? Well, we're to be patiently waiting, but we're to be working while we're waiting. Look at verse 9. James goes on to say in verse 9, notice what he says. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. So, those of us who have experienced any type of impatience, we, I, I kind of know what he's saying here. And... For a while, it, I had to really look at that verse and had to really think about it. It just seemed like it was out of place. Look at it again. Don't grumble against each other. He's talking about patience, the patience of a farmer. And then he says, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Took me a while to understand that in his context but here's what I believe he's saying when things don't go right when things don't go well are you like me and you look for somebody to blame am I, am I the only one that does that things don't go well and you look for somebody or something to blame that on Think about it. Here, here were some people here who obviously were under persecution, who were not being treated fairly, and they began to grumble against each other. Things like, well, I don't know what, I don't know why things are going so well for him. He, he's the biggest heathen in the community. I don't know why these rich people over here are showing him any kind of favoritism. Oh, I know what he's doing. He's just kissing up. He's just, trying to, he's just trying to take care of himself. He's just trying to watch out after himself. These are the kinds of things that we're saying. He said, don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. He's saying, don't, don't, don't criticize your brother. Don't judge him. God is the judge. And when Jesus comes back, how do, how do you want him to find you? you do, do you want him to find you waiting patiently on him no matter what the circumstances are? Or do you want him to find you griping and grumbling and complaining about how things are? And you know what I've learned? 
griping about my situation doesn't really change a whole lot. <laughs> doesn't fix much. Let me tell you about my latest dilemma, can I? I'm not going to. No, I'll tell you. <laughs> I just, I just kind of thought, oh well. Y'all, any of you driven by my, my our house and seen the fence on the backside? You know what I found out Thursday? I built that whole back fence all the way across the back, and I am 16 feet over my property line. <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> And all I could think of was, oh, my goodness, all those hot days where we sweat, my brother and I, we sweated, we labored, pouring cement, setting posts, making sure they're perfect. And listen, when my brother's in on the job, it's going to be perfect. It's just so close enough ain't, ain't good enough. It has to be perfect. And so we labored with it. And we put it 16 feet over the property line. <laughs> I said, Lord, your fence is over the line. What are you going to do about it? He said, son, you're going to fix it. <laughs> Look at verse 11. He says, as you know, we consider, I don't want to jump that far ahead. Let's go back to the second point. Forgive me for chasing that rabbit. When you are mistreated, we need patience, right? Look at verse 10. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. You need patience when you are mistreated, right? Do you, when someone does you dirty, somebody mistreats you, are, are you patient? Come on, be honest. Because uh, some of you want to get in their face, amen? Take that finger and job them in. My dad used to do me that way. I feel like he'd poking holes in my chest. He'd say, son, I don't want to. And so that's the way we want to react when people do us wrong, when they mistreat us. We want to get back at them. We're going to straighten them out. We need patience, and there is Perhaps no better example in all of the Bible than the patience of the prophets. They were so mistreated, persecuted, killed even, tormented. And yet they had a lot of patience. Even during the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke about the prophets who were ridiculed, spoken against. They were persecuted for God's sake, for, the, for his kingdom and his work. And I, I just think that the prophets are a great example of what it looks like to be patient when times are tough, when you're being mistreated. Joseph is another great example. Joseph's brothers hated him because he was favored by his father. So what did they do? They were going to kill him, and Reuben said, Oh, no, no, we're not going to do that. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let's sell him, let's sell him as a slave. So he, they sold him. He went to be Potiphar's slave, Potiphar's chief steward. Potiphar's wife had an eye on him, so she accuses him of, of making passes at her, of sexually harassing her, and so Potiphar had him thrown in jail. Joseph interpreted some dreams for the, for the Pharaoh's servants, and he said, now when you go back to work, remember me, and they didn't remember him. You know, if I'd have been Joseph, and this is going to be honest with you, this is, this is what I'd have done. My brothers had sold me into slavery. I said, if I ever get away from here, I'm fixing to get even with my brothers. I'm going to fix them. If somebody had had me thrown into a prison over a false accusation, if I ever got out of there, I was fixing to go back to that person. I was going to get that right. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd have said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. I guarantee you, if, if I had done a favor to some people in prison and they got out and didn't remember me, I guarantee you, when I got out, I'd remember them. Mm hmm I'd see if I couldn't create a situation where they'd go back and spend the rest of the time that I spent in there. That's not what Joseph did. 
Every situation Joseph found himself in, he did it as unto the Lord. And God took care of him. One day he was given the privilege to be the prime minister of Egypt and to save a world from famine. And there was a time when he had the power and his brothers came to him. He could have had them executed for what they did, but he didn't do that. He said, I'm here because the Lord sent me here. You meant evil, but God meant it for good. Isn't that really the way that we need to look at things? When, when, when we're in a difficult situation? God, you're sovereign, you're holy, you're good, you're just, you're full of grace and mercy. You know me, you know who I am, you know where I am, you know why I am here. So here I am. Whatever you want to do in my life, Lord, here I am. Fix me. I know I must be broken. You know, you don't need any patience when everything around you is going great, do you? Boy, that's lots of fun, huh? Everything is good. What do you need patience for? When they... We need patience when our world is falling apart, when it's coming down around our neck. That's when we need patience. You know, the sad thing is there are a lot of people that are living by this, by this false theology, this health and wealth, God bless you, prosperity bunch that's destroying people's lives. Why? Because they teach and preach that if you're going through difficult times, it's because you've got sin in your life. You, you know, the, the word patience, you know, it means in, to endure under to endure under difficult times. Even when those around you, like those of Job, who said, Job, you've just got sin in your life. That's why you're going through all of the trouble. 2 Timothy 3.12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. He said, but he said, be not dismayed. Don't be discouraged. He said, I have overcome the world. Psalm 39, 14. Have you seen this verse lately? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 11 and 12, people will insult you and hurt you. They will even lie and say all kinds of evil things about you because you follow me. You say, well, I haven't had that trouble lately. Well, maybe you're not following him. Because if you're following him, if you're speaking when he wants you to speak, if you're living like he wants you to live, if you're doing like he wants you to do, somebody somewhere is going to gripe and complain and accuse you. They're going, to call, they're, going to, they're going to just think you're an idiot. But when they do, you ought to be happy. You ought to be happy that they see enough in you that looks a lot like Christ that they would criticize that. They criticized him. Rejoice and be glad because you have great reward. Waiting for you in heaven, people did the same evil things to the prophets who lived before you. We need patience when we don't know why. Look at verse 11. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You see, you need patience when you don't know why. I don't know about you, but I've had things happen in my life that I didn't understand why and still don't. Still don't understand it. Many of us have lost loved ones. We don't understand why. Some of you are fighting with illnesses. And it's been a struggle for a long, long time. And maybe your question is, well, why? Why do I have to go through this? You know, it is not a sin to ask God why. It's, it's not. He's, he's big enough. He's tough enough. And he can answer your question, maybe. Maybe. Amen? 
I, I don't, I, I'm pretty blessed health-wise. Do, do you know I don't take any medications? I'm 71 years old, and I, I, I don't take anything. I'm, I am, and I give all the glory to God. I don't know why. Why am I, why am I in such good health and others who are younger than me are struggling with health? I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. It's just that you're sinful and I'm not. <laughs> I was just saying if you were listening. <laughs> Some of it's difficult to understand. I don't, I don't have all the answers. You see, the prevailing law in the day of Job was, Job... You're going through all of this because you've not been faithful to the Lord. Poor old Job, he was just uh, the object of an experiment. Satan goes to the Lord and he says, huh, there's no such thing as a faithful servant. God says, oh yeah? Have you seen my boy Job? Hmm? Satan says, well, he wouldn't be faithful to you. He wouldn't serve you if you didn't bless him. And God said, I can prove you wrong. You see, you can do anything you want to him except take his life. And boy, did he take from him. He took all of Job's family except his wife. And the only reason he didn't take her is because he still wanted to use her. You remember when she said you ought to just cuss God, give up and die? See, Satan wasn't through with her. He'd have killed her too. And he couldn't kill Job because God said, no, I won't let you do that. Took everything he had, lost it all. And God stayed faithful. I think it's in Job chapter 1, verse 21. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be blessed, be praised. That was Job's attitude. I didn't have anything when I came in. I don't have anything when I go out of here. God gives, God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I wish I had time to go into all of the things that went on in Job's life, but I'll just tell you this. You know how the story ends? God restored him twice over what he had, what he had lost. Why? Because, because Job believed in the sovereignty of God and he stayed faithful and he never cursed God. He never accused God. Listen, God has the right to do anything he wants to do. Amen? We know and understand that God is full of grace and mercy. And if you really believe in and trust the sovereignty of God, we ought to be able to say, Lord, I don't know what you're doing in my life, but that's okay. You know and I trust you. Here's one thing I do know. Romans 8, 28. And I don't care what, what kind of trial that you're going through. God knows where you are. And he knows what's going on in your life. And that's a whole, really, that's really a whole other message on suffering, which we may do here one day soon. But, but, but here's, here's the truth of his word. We know that in all things, God works for the good. Now that's huge, folks, and I, I don't even know that I could articulate how huge that is. All things God works for good. He didn't say that all things are good. He just said he can take all things, good, bad, or otherwise, and work for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. That's God's grace and his mercy. That no matter what's going on in your life, he can take that and he can work it for good. When I lost my daughter in 2012, I didn't understand why. I still don't. I still don't. <clears throat> but it wouldn't change anything. 
if I knew why, it wouldn't change anything. So that's okay. Because I'm trusting him. And you may be here today and you got something going on in your life and you don't understand why. You don't understand how. You don't understand why. Just understand this. If, if, you'll just, if you'll just be patient with the Lord, just be patient with him. Say, okay, God, here I am. I am in this situation right here. And you know where I am and you know who I am. I love you. I trust you. So here I am. Whatever my situation is, I'm giving it to you. And I'm trusting you, God, to work good out of it for my sake. For your honor, for your glory, and my sake. God, do something good. I believe he will. I believe he will because his word says he will. So, how are you with patience today? So I, I'd give most of you an A because you didn't get up and walk out. You had enough patience to set through that. <laughs> but we're about to leave here. And it might be easy to be patient right here, right now. It might be, but we're about to leave here. We're about to walk out those doors and go get in our cars and go eat dinner. And we're going to come across people who get in our way. We're going to set at a stoplight for probably 20 minutes. <laughs> really only a minute. And we're going to be tempted to fuss and gripe and complain and blame the lights and blame the people in front of us. We're going to go to a restaurant and we're going to gripe and complain because the waitress didn't do us right, waited too long. They were here after us and got their food before us. All that kind of stuff. Our patience is about to be tested. Amen? We walk out that door, so let me ask you. Are you going to really think about the patience of a farmer the patience of the prophets who were persecuted and the patience of Job who lost literally everything and yet he remained faithful, patient and faithful.